we looked at the nine steps in uh, systems analysis and uh, we will continue this time first by looking at an overview of what we discussed last time and some um, additional points I want to make. So, let us just uh, represent these steps as a, a graph. This graph essentially shows the flow of various events which happens when you start a systems analysis. This model consists of first starting with requirement determination, then specification, feasibility analysis, system specification analysis, system design, system implementation, system evaluation and system maintenance. Of course, as a part of specification analysis, we have to do a hardware study also. Now, the way in which this uh, graph is shown, it looks as though it is one after the other after the other. That is why it is kind of known as a water flow or a waterfall model. Um, but actually in practice, it is never a straight line in the sense that you never start one and go to the next and do not look back at what happened earlier. For instance, you start off with a requirement determination. Deter requirement determination phase primarily has the purpose of finding out what the requirements are for the uh, uh, for the company which need to be computerized. And um, when you go to specification, when you start specifying, it might turn out that some of the requirements which are stated in the determination phase may become not so relevant in terms of the priority of the organization. Further, if you go to feasibility analysis, feasibility analysis step, what might happen is that what you considered as something which is required may not be feasible with the current status of the organization. So, you really have to go back and forth. In other words, when you get to the feasibility analysis, you may find out that certain types of requirements which you specified, even though ideally one would like to ha have it, it may not be possible within the cost constraint, within the time constraint, within the available people and so on to implement. So, you got to prioritize and uh, go back and uh, re talk to the uh, person who or the organization which wanted you to uh, computerize some other operations and tell them that uh, uh, maybe this is going to be too expensive or uh, take a too, too long a time or it is not going to be feasible and so on. And um, similarly, when you go to system, look at hardware study and system design, you may again have a similar situation. And uh, so, you really have to kind of go in some sense back and forth. That is, each step you complete and take a relook at what, what went on earlier and uh, decide whether what went on earlier is um, appropriate. If, it fi if you find at any step that uh, there is a difficulty of implementing what was expected to be implemented, before you actually start implementing, you really have to go back and change it. Because once you start implementation, you are committed to yourself and there will be a lot of uh, money spent and many projects which are taken up by software companies get into this difficulty. There is they get into implementation too early without doing a proper study and when they are through half implementation, they find out all difficulties. And so, there is a so called cost overrun and a time overrun. And uh, this point is uh, in fact made very effectively in a book uh, called the Myth Mythical Man Month. The book was written 
by an IBM engineer who was primarily in charge of developing large software system. And uh, he said the mythical man month is that always they think that one man month is required to do this, but uh, it is it's, uh, it's only an imagination. I mean they estimate it, but the estimates always come incorrect. In other words, whatever actually happens takes much longer than what they thought it will take. In other words, it turns out that most systems analysts and software engineers are over optimistic. They are over optimistic and they think they can finish certain things in certain time and they are not conservative. They ought to be conservative. So, the lesson which has been learned over the years is that do not ever underestimate the effort, time and money involved. And any company which is able to do a reasonable estimate of time, cost and so on is the company which is going to make a profit. Otherwise, the company is going to go under and also get into serious difficulties in terms of the uh, contracts and so on. So, the point I am trying to make is that this model where you I can I looked at each step one after the other is not entirely the way it happens in practice. And uh, that is why they talk about a so called spiral model. That is you uh, get to some step and go back and review the previous step and continue to review at every stage. And of course, the final review will definitely take place at the time of system evaluation. And system evaluation time a lot of things will come out in terms of what uh, was expected and what was actually achieved and what need to be changed and so on. And so, after a certain time you have to go back and maybe redo a lot of things which you did earlier. It is somewhat like uh, the uh, situation in uh, building a house. Even in building a house there may be a clear plan at the start of the project, but as you proceed you may find that the cost of items have gone up, you are going, going through a budget overruns and so on. And so, a householder may have only a limited budget and he may start at that time to reduce his requirements. So, instead of using uh, uh, say granite for the floor, he may decide let us go and use mosaic or some other cheaper material or instead of using certain kind of expensive paint, use a cheaper paint. In other words, in all these, in all real life uh, problems of uh, making any complex system, there is always an uh, intermediate review while the uh, uh, project is going on. And these intermediate reviews will require revisit of the earlier steps which was done. Okay. So, this is a point <coughs> which uh, you have to always remember when you look at the so called system life cycle. The whole idea of a life cycle I reiterate is to be able to kind of have some milestones. That is you for each of these you decide certain amount of time you allocate and you have a milestone. And that milestone effectively assesses progress. So, once you assess the progress then you can say whether you are over time or under time in terms of the time you allocated for the project. So, from that point of view it, uh, it is important to have the steps okay. and but the steps as I said are not really all that watertight that one will run into the other. Okay. But primarily the idea is to only have some method of having a clear understanding of the important steps to be followed before you come to the final implementation. So, this is the entire process of uh, going through a preliminary systems analysis. Now, this uh, analysis is done normally before actual implementation. In other words, there are two phases in any any project development and also there are two types of uh, 
uh, software so systems which uh, uh, software engineers and computer scientists normally would be designing during their uh, uh, professional life. Okay. There are one, one, one is called a software services. What is meant by software services is that uh, you go to a, an existing company and uh, provide them information system or services to improve their operations so that the profitability of that company improves. So, in other words, you are actually within quotes computerizing the operations of the organization. Like for instance, as in the, in the case of Indian Railways, the um, implementation of the entire reservation system was a beginning of computerizing the operations of the railways and it led to other side advantages which made it possible for the railways to take tactical and strategic decisions and so on. So, the point is that these are the you go to an existing organization and uh, you try to either if it is not already computerized try to give them computers and computer systems to uh, do their business better or if they are already got some computing facility try to improve that system in view of the changes in technology and newer uh, systems which have come which continue to come. For instance, a simple example is in the case of this retail industry. Retail industry, what I mean by that is companies like Walmart, companies like Food World in India and so on. They are very large, uh, uh, large retail shops. And uh, when they first computerized, they were using barcodes for the products and so on. The barcodes used to be scanned to get an idea about the product, the cost of the product and the creating a bill and all that. And now, the barcode is being replaced by a new technology called RFID, that is radio, radio frequency identification, where instead of using a, a barcode and scanning it by hand, there is a small chip which is embedded in, into the product and when the product passes the uh, counter where the bill is prepared that is read wirelessly and automatically bills are prepared. So, that there is no need for a human intervention. So, this RFID tags are becoming inexpensive. So, that means these retail shops now are asking uh, shall I change my barcode system to RFID system and uh, go to the RFID system and uh, will it in what way will it improve my uh, operations? Same way, so called logistics companies like companies like uh, you know this professional couriers or uh, uh, FedEx as they call FedEx is one large company or DT, DRTC in India and so on. Uh, many courier companies which uh, take packets and letters and deliver to homes and so on. So, the tracking of that and uh, making sure that delivery takes place within a certain contracted period, they, they require management of the packages from the time they uh, get it from the customer to the time it is delivered to the intended addressee. So, this tracking is all nowadays done by using computing system. Previously, it was not being done that way. So, there also the technology is changing with the coming of internet they are looking at different methods of tracking and they provide on the web information for any customer to find out given his package number where it is currently in the in the uh, in the in the in the chain whether, whether it is in the plane or it is already arrived and things like that so you can actually track even customers can track and customers are normally do not track letters, but they do track if they send something very expensive or something which is required very urgently. Okay. So, the, these things what are the ones where the software services 
are utilized by companies. The other very important area is called software products. Software products are uh, systems will be used again and again. <coughs> Let, uh, for example, a word processor is a software product, all right. The um, uh, another software product is uh, say a compiler for Java or an operating system. So, these are all products which will be used again and again. But also now new products are coming like accounting products. There is, uh, there is a, a fixed accounting method which is used and there is a product you can buy and implement. In other words, you uh, instead of tailor making you have got ready made th things available which with sm some modification can be usable. So, these are kinds of products which are coming. There are a whole lot of security products which are now coming to make sure that whatever information you send on the network is secure. So, these, these are the types of products. The product life cycle is entirely different from the life cycle which you are talking about for services. At this time in India, it turns out that software services dominates. In other words, almost major majority of our companies uh, such as uh, the large ones like TCS or Infosys or Wipro, all of them are primarily uh, about maybe more than 80 percent of their total revenue comes from the software services they give. That means 80 percent of the employment of uh, computer science graduates will be in the services industry. Even though we are trying to get into the product industry, that is somewhat more difficult and also it is in fact more profitable. So, that at this time we are not yet graduated to a product type in any significant way. There are of course, a few product like banking products and so on which are there in the which are based made in India, but by and large services for which we are known. Now, in this services area, the major uh, uh, job of uh, doing the systems analysis for a company which requires these software services is done by a person called systems analyst. So, what we are going to look at now is uh, what is the role of a system analyst in designing a system and how does it interact with others. Now, uh, system systems analyst is uh, the in fact the probably most important person in the in the um, process of uh, system development and creation of the requirements. But if you look at an overall software services, there are many people involved in providing the services. To look at the way in which it happens, there are a number of steps you might say again, which a software services company has to go through before they actually deliver a software product. The first thing is of course, to be able to get a customer and be able to market your company saying that your company has got certain special uh, you might say talents or special experience to be able to do that particular software service better. So, this is what is called the marketing part that is you have to market your services. The marketing part is really done by the managers, top managers that is who are in the field for with the company for a long time. In fact, the top managers are the ones who continuously look at the markets, they kind of look at the strategy and they detect what are the possible customers and so on and then they identify the customer. Having identified the customer, they send out people that is marketing you might say software marketing to uh, essentially tell them what experience they have, 
what they can do and stuff like that. So, that is a very first important step to be able to establish some credibility of your group in terms of being able to do the required service for a company. So, having gotten some kind of a contract or at least a first step or a, you might say a, a foothold into the company, now you have to start looking at the requirements and uh, looking at the uh, uh, in what way you can improve their operations, so that you can convince the management to take your services uh, and uh, improve their operations in a sig hopefully a significant way. So, you have to be able to convince them and show what is the kind of profitability they will get and the cost which will be involved in doing this and uh, do a cost benefit analysis. So, this is the part which normally is played by the systems analysis group which starts this work. Let me take an example of uh, uh, from real life a, from a different field namely again uh, house building. There are uh, number of different types of people involved in house building. First of course, is that the uh, architect has to sell the services. So, the, pers the architect has to know uh, who are the pers persons who are looking for uh, services architect and the architect uh, normally uh, would, would be uh, employed by a person based on the reputation of the architect of having uh, uh, done a good job earlier or through friends and through maybe websites or whatever. Okay. So, having found an architect, then the first step the, archi the architect's idea now is to get from you your requirements and be able to give you a plan for the house as I pointed out and also interact with the engineer for construction to be able to get an estimate of how much it is going to cost you. So, this is something similar to the systems analyst. Systems analyst is really equivalent in terms of the software systems. He is like a system architect. He has to kind of, in fact, many companies call these people system architects uh, because they are primarily uh, have a different uh, type of, uh, uh, you might say, uh, knowledge and uh, makeup compared to uh, the people who are going to actually construct or implement. If I take, go back to my example, in the construction of a large building or a house or whatever, the, uh, the architect gives the com complete architectural plan and cost estimates. So, that is the first step. And also at that time, the, the materials which will be used and the time estimates of time which will be required to do it and all that will be given by this architect. So, once the architect gives that, now a number of people come into the picture later on. There is a, there is a actual structural engineer. Structural engineer will uh, give you the structural drawings in terms of foundation and in terms of various uh, pillars and so on. For a large building, the structural engineer is extremely important person to give you, give you a, 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 a stable structure which is which will st stand up to a number of things like even earthquakes or floods and things like that. And so, a structural engineer gives you a structural design of the, uh, of the building. The architect does not have to be a structural engineer, but the architect has to understand what the structural engineer has done in terms of materials he used and uh, the architect has to be able to tell the structural engineer that there are some new materials which have come, which may make it somewhat cheaper uh, to have that structure. And uh, so, there is always a, a feedback between these two to decide on the structure. Having come up with the structure, 
The structural engineer of course, may be hired by the architect or the architect may have a contractor, who is contractor has subcontractors like structural engineers and so on. And then st structural engineer is one part and having come up with the structural drawings, then you have to have uh, uh, the next uh, set of drawings to be prepared in terms of the walls, the, uh, the, uh, how the other uh, material to be used and a complete uh, engineering drawing uh, for implementation. The engineering drawing for implementation is made by the civil engineers who are also structural, who also can interact with structural engineers. It, it is uh, in fact, civil engineers also know structures. The same way that the uh, architects also know structures, but structural engineers are specialists. They know more about the structures. And then once the civil engineer prepares all the plans, then the next step is to have workers, the masons uh, and so on. And even in a large buildings, apart from the structure, there are also other issues which are involved. Like uh, you need to have an electrical system. So, electrical system means uh, air conditioning and uh, lighting system and security system and a whole lot of things which go with electrical systems. So, there is a whole lot of there is electrical contractor, electrical engineers who do this electrical part. And there are, uh, if you are going to put air conditioning, you need to have air conditioning specialists to be able to tell you what is the heat load of that building going to be and uh, in order to meet the heat load, what kind of air conditioning is required and how much of tonnage is required and things like that. So, that is the air conditioning specialist who went into the picture. And after that part, then there is a plumbing, the water lines and so on, what, what plumbing has to be done and plumbers get into that. So, all these work has already coordinated because you cannot start your uh, uh, electrical conduits before you finish the walls because normally the conduits are put inside the walls. So, there is always a step by step in, in terms of the fact that there are certain things which can be done only after certain other things are completed. Like unless the foundation is completed and the pillars are completed, the walls cannot be put up. Unless the walls are put up, the electrical conduits cannot come up. Unless the electrical conduits come up, AC cannot start. So, there is a, a complete interlinking of all these. So, they work on a certain kind of a a uh, chart, time chart, okay, which is prepared by the architect giving certain times for each of them. So, in the analogy, equivalently in computing, there will be specialists who will be network specialists who will talk about what best network to use. There will be uh, programming specialists who know about a particular type of programming system to be used. Okay. So, there will be uh, database specialist who know how, how well to design a database. So, there will be different types of people who all have to cooperate before you make up a full, full software system. Just like before a large building is constructed, there are a whole lot of specialists who have to really work together and they have to understand one another, one another to be able to without any type of a, a misunderstanding which leads to time or flow or cost or flow, have a proper system design. So, this is the kind of situation like which happens in complex software systems just like it happens in complex large building projects. Okay. So, the role of systems analyst is somewhat similar to the role of a an architect. And um, so, in order the architect has got certain attributes. Similarly, systems analyst must have certain qualities or attributes to be able to successfully architect a system. And a certain number of tools he must use, tools of trade you might say, in order to do that. Like architect's tools are drawings, okay, uh, scale models and estimations, things of that type. So, We also look at the nature of the 
were tasks performed by system analyst, his attributes as I said, tools. So, the first step as you pointed out in which the systems analyst gets into the act is uh, defining requirements. So, defining requirements is a fairly complicated operation and takes a fair amount of time. In fact, the amount of time spent in requirement determination or defining requirements is well worth it because if you start the design and in the middle you find that you are not building certain requirements or the customer suddenly thinks about certain requirements which you did not think of at the beginning, then you have to go back and redo a lot of things you did. So, at the stage of requirement determination, it is good to spend a fair amount of time to find out and it involves interviewing a lot of users. When, is meant, when I say interviewing, you have to talk to people starting from top managers to the ultimate users who are going to actually operate the system like clerks and so on. So, all layers of people they have to be able to interview and prepare reports based on that interview. Apart from the interview, they also have to kind of look at documents and read documents in the organization because documents will give you the existing methods they are using for existing methods they are using for operations. So, looking at documents, understanding documents, interviewing users, understanding what they require and so on is the first part which requires a certain amount of generalist who is able to have patience in listening and understanding what one wants. And then uh, prioritizing requirements by obtaining the user's consensus. In other words, the, uh, there will be always conflicting requirements and one has to kind of say which are most important which are not all that important and within the conf conflict resolve the conflicts and we come up with a consensus among the ultimate uh, users of the system to come up with the best possible prioritized uh, requirements and which, which you will try to do. So, in doing this as I said you have to ga gather facts, interviewing is one method of gathering facts. Uh, facts not only mean actually looking at documents and collecting data, but even things like opinions of people, what they feel and so on. So, there are lots of things which are hazy, which is not well stated. So, these are the ones which are difficult and that is why interview is required, because hazy requirements are the ones which you uh, find out uh, while talking and uh, as I said, a lower level users should also be consulted. And after uh, doing all this, I had an appropriate system. Is the requirements converted to specific requirements? So, uh, so up, uh, you come up with a just like an architect comes up with an uh, what the architect considers is appropriate house for you or appropriate building for a company that is presented to the customer and the customer has to gain approve, otherwise you have to go back and change the uh, thing. You have to suggest many alternative solutions. A good architect will not give a single plan. The good architect will give multiple different plans because there is not, there is no unique way in which you can solve a problem. There are many, many different possibilities or different ways and one may be uh, liked by your customer for no good reason in terms of maybe quantitative reasons, but maybe even bias. Okay, so one may not be liked. So within that, you have to give alternate so that the ultimately your user or the customer, as I say, is a king. The customer is, is your uh, the person who is going to pay you. So you have to and pay attention to the customer and his whatever his uh, uh, 
uh, feelings are in terms of the, the best system which he feels will best require meet his requirements. Quantify cost and benefits. This is the part of the feasibility analysis. Now, in fact, once you quantify cost and benefits, you again have to kind of, um, if you have alternates, for each alternative, you have to give the cost and you have to give the benefits. So, so that the user can make an informed judgment. Informed judgment is based on the cost benefit analysis and uh, all the multiple solutions which you give. So, unless you give multiple solutions, uh, normally customers are not satisfied. They say when can't you do it in a better way or a different way and so on. So, very often the customer also may suggest that there is also another way because after all systems analyst is, is not a, a person who uh, is been uh, with that company for too long. See the, the point is that the systems analyst today may be designing a system for an insurance company, tomorrow he may be doing it for a hospital, another, another project may be for a bank. So, over the professional life of a systems analyst or systems architect, he may be designing systems for many different types of organizations, hospitals, hotels, banks, insurance companies, transport organizations, logistics operations and so on. So, each of these companies and organizations have their own jargons which you normally will not understand. And so, you better have to, you have to ask. Whenever you get a doubt, it is better to ask and clarify. And many people use acronyms which we do not fully understand. And acronyms can be expanded by the person once you say that you do not understand what the acronym means. So, these are the questions which you have to be careful with the, with the analyst. And uh, because of that, there is both good, good things and bad things, you know. Uh, if a person has gone through many different types of companies, he is not biased with a certain solution. If he is doing banks all the time to wait for some particular bank something, he will try to kind of duplicate for the other bank and it may not be liked by the other bank because it is not a unique difference which comes. So, there is always an advantage of having a, being a generalist who has a, a an idea of many different types of projects on which uh, uh, the person has worked. So, even systems analysts also want, want them want their management to give them different types of projects so that they will grow or they will learn more about this job rather than being kind of put into one narrow area all their life because it could become boring. Okay. So, the point really is which I am trying to make is that you have to have multiple solutions and give cost benefit analysis for each, of each solution. And the uh, once you come up with the requirements, you have to come up with specifications. And the specifications have to be on one hand understood by the user and also by the programmer who is going to implement. For instance, when the architect talks to you, the architect presents you a drawing which you understand because drawing is something which is a universal language you might say. Even without being a, an engineer, if a plan of your house is given and an elevation of your house is given like a scale model with cardboard, any, any person with common sense will understand what the person is getting. Similarly, you have to have some method of documentation which is understood by lay users. Programs will not be understood by lay users. So, programs are not really documentation from the point of view of the ultimate user, managers and so on. So, you have to give, have some tool which is more like a drawing. On the one hand, the drawing is understood by the user, the drawing also is understood by the contractor who is going to build your 
build your house. So, the it has got to be similarly you had to have tools which on the one hand is understood by the users or the other hand understood by the programmers to be able to program. It should be precise in detail, unless it is precise in detail programming cannot proceed. Okay. And uh, you should also at that stage account for possible changes. As I said, software systems unlike hardware systems will always undergo change during their lifetime. So, it is extremely important to be able to build a system which will accommodate change easily without great amount of re, re you know breaking something and building again. So, uh, you have to keep that in mind and account for possible changes which may occur. And you design the system logically like nowadays object oriented methods are the ones which are used to allow these flexible changes also to be able to use existing building blocks. So, there are a lot of advantages which people talk about in terms of objects. There is also object based diagrams which are used nowadays which can be made, un made understandable by both the users and by the persons who are going to program. So, the certain types of notations which are being experimented with not universally used, but experimented with a lot of people accepted it in terms of providing a proper interface between users and the designers or implementers. And we have to kind of look at the databases to be designed, normalize them, have a proper test plan. Testing is extremely important before you actually uh, deliver a system. So, a test plan has got to be designed at the time you uh, design the system, so that before it gets into implementation stage, you are able to do some preliminary testing. So, you do not wait till the last moment to be able to test the system and find if there are problems with the system. And I, I, I reiterate that it should be a modular um, design to, to be able to accommodate changes. And you have to be able to evaluate it after using for some time, plan periodicity of evaluation, how often are you are going to evaluate, modify as needed. So, these are points which are required in terms of the evaluation, because system evaluation which is done is important to be able to deliver a system. As I said, after evaluation you also have to maintain. Maintenance means not only correcting errors which you made, but also putting in improvements or uh, at the end of the process the users may think that certain requirements are not fully met and so they, they would like to kind of implement something new or have something new. And uh, that of course, normally companies will ask for extra time and money to do that, but if you are able to do that reasonably fast to the satisfaction of the customer, next time around if the customer has got something to be done, he will rely on you. So, there is always to kind of have a good will with the customer, you have to be able to accommodate at least certain changes at the evaluation time at with reasonable ease. And later on of course, any large changes which is required, uh, you can cost it and then you can ask for a new contract and things like that. So, the, the in order to be able to do all this, there are certain attributes which are required 
persistence analyst. He has to understand the organization, jargon and practice the organization, know the management functions, what functions are there and uh, for each function what is required. These things he considered at fair length earlier. Knowledge of computers and software, system design tools and uh, keep abreast of modern developments. So, you should understand what uh, new things are coming in the horizon. Like for instance, I pointed out the RFID tags uh, which, are, which are replacing barcodes. So, the analyst must know that the RFID tags are coming and they are going to be used and uh, they will be demanded by users. And similarly, there are lots of changes in networks which are coming, higher speed networks are coming. And similarly, there is also lot of, lot of changes in the uh, computers themselves, higher amount of memory, different types of memories. Like now, flash memory was not there 3, 4 years ago. Now, flash memories are replacing uh, floppy disks. So, the analyst must know that flash memories have come and wherever flash can be used, he should be able to tell the user that you better use flash in these cases. So, the point is that computing technology is an evolving discipline. It changes almost every 3, 4 years there is a big change and there is so called we call paradigm shift. There is a shift from one method to another method or one basic uh, type of organizational uh, architecture of systems to another architecture of systems. So, architectural changes also take place uh, with changes in technology. It is lot more rapid in computing compared to other engineering disciplines. So, that is what makes it very challenging. So, he has to keep abreast of modern developments. That is true of course, as, uh, for any good engineering organization and an and engineer, but by and large it is lot more important for computer science people. Now, a systems analyst has to as I said interview users at different levels, Start, starting with the top management down to the uh, clerical staff who are going to be using the system. So, he needs to be able to have good interpersonal relationships, need to work as a team member, lead smaller teams, interface with programmers and users, users at various levels. He should be able to motivate the, uh, the team to perform in terms of the programs they do, in terms of the databases and so on. So, by and large systems analyst role is one is that of a leader also. Now, uh, at the time of uh, talking to a user and having when, when the requirements are determined by for the user, you have to prepare some kind of a report and present orally the requirements to the manager, managers of the user organization. So, in order to be able to do that, you have to have good communication skills or early presentation skills. And that is one of the reasons why nowadays in the computer science curriculum, they try to put one particular subject called technical communication. Technical communication orally <coughs> is an extremely important attribute of a good systems analyst. In fact, one would find during a professional life that oral communication is important at almost all levels. That is, if you are a marketing person to market, you have to be able to convince your customer that the product you are trying to sell or the service you are trying to sell is worth it. So, you have to be able to communicate orally in a convincing manner. In doing that, 
you must have a reasonable amount of confidence and uh, appear that you are a master of the subject. So, these are important attributes of uh, an analyst to communicate and also you have to write the report because ultimately whatever you communicate orally as you put down in paper as a report. The report is used by two types of people. The report is used by the uh, managers of the organization for which you are doing the service and the report also will be used by your manager to understand what you have done and the report also will be used by the persons who are going to implement the system. So, that person has an overview. So, report must be very clear and nicely written as a clarity is very important, brief and to the point and, and understand them without too much of jargon and so on. So, that any person can re, with a reasonable amount of intelligence can understand it. So, report writing is important and be able to patiently answer questions from the users of, a, of the system. Very often the questions may be very, may, we may consider as very stupid because after all the company for which you are designing the system, the person who is not an expert in computing. So, he may ask certain questions which are almost stupid, you may consider stupid, but you got to be fairly diplomatic and uh, be able to show that uh, you know properly answer the question you know to the conviction of the person. And uh, so, this requires a certain amount of diplomacy and patience. Analytical mind which is of course required for any any uh, good engineering uh, person, but more so for a, an analyst because uh, you must have problem solving attitude to look at a problem to be able to solve it in different ways. Uh, ability to assess the trade offs uh, when you do a feasibility analysis, there are certain gains and certain losses. In any large system, there is always a trade off which is there. And uh, like a simple example of trade off in civil engineering may be that uh, if you uh, paint your walls with uh, plastic emulsion paint, it is going to be very expensive at the beginning, but that will stand for 10 years. 10 years you do not have to do a thing and uh, anything which is happens to the wall you can just go and wipe it off with soap. Of course, the benefit the cost is high and the benefit is there, but if you want, if you want, can't afford it, then you use a st simple distemper. You have to tell the customer that you have to spend again after three years. So, the question of what the customer chooses. Same way, in a, in a, in a system, you may produce different types of systems. One would be fairly expensive accommodate a lot of change and you do not have to do maintenance because the already it has taken into account certain requirements which you foresaw may occur later on and implement it at this time itself which the customer did not think of and so the cost is higher. You might say that you know later on you may have to may not have to change anything. Uh, this is going to provide you uh, for 5 years no problems. Okay. So, these are the kind of issues. So, these are trade offs. A sound common sense of course, to be able to understand different fields and so on. Uh, you, have, you must have a, it is very easy to say sound common sense, but the more difficult thing to get that kind of a common sense which you get from experience. Curiosity to learn about new organizations and what those organizations do. And the tools which are used, like uh, like a plan for a building, a data flow diagrams are certain tools which will give the flow of data into various processes, the outputs, how the outputs are taken, how they are processed by the next step, and it gives a clear idea to the user of what documents he is supposed to create 
how the documents flow or data flows and how it is, how it will be processed, what kind of reports you will get. So, even a prototype at that stage may be something which is useful. Decision tables for complex decision processes, we got a very complex set of rules in insurance company, you can explain that as a table, a decision table to both the customer and also to the programmer, both sides can use it. And uh, in fact, it has been found that a good decision table brings out even errors in the current rules of insurance companies, because they have not thought out logically in great detail when they formulated rules. And rules have a tendency, they have some set, set of preliminary rules and new rules and amendments are added off and on. So, amendments in the add, they may contradict some older rules. So, these are not taken care of in the in the system. So, when you do an analysis, logical analysis, decision table, these, these things come out. And there are modeling languages called universal modeling language, which is part of the object oriented design methodology, which one uh, has to know. There are a, a techniques called use case analysis, look at different cases and uh, use cases and so on. Normalizing databases, this is again technique which a database designer has to know. Various testing tools which are there and nowadays uh, people look for so called ISO, uh, International Standard Organization or uh, Carnegie Mellon's uh, procedure manuals for deciding on a getting at a quali good quality system. So, these are quality constraints or certain procedures you follow. The, the ISO and CMM are, are essentially tells you the documentation and procedures you have to follow. If you follow these procedures and have this documentation, a certain amount of confidence that the quality of the product or the software system you produce will be up to the mark. So, the whole idea is to come up with systematization of procedures and systematization of procedures is a primary aim of both ISO and CMM. So, these are things which <laughs> an analyst should know. So, this kind of uh, we have reviewed this whole area of systems analysis and uh, the roles of systems analyst. Now, I think we have to get into the actual act of the various tools and techniques in designing a system, which we will do in the next uh, lectures and go on from there.